gosh. Jesse, that was too much. Thank you so much. Um, Before we get started, I would actually just like, if everyone, if you have a drink in your hand, I would like to make a toast to Mr. and Mrs. Mayle, who could not be here tonight. But shit, 50 years? That's amazing. Chris and I have been together, married now for exactly five months, and I'm, I'm counting down to 50. Okay, cheers to Mr. and Mrs. Mayle. Much li that. much literature has happened at this mic. <laughs> okay, let's see here. All right. Um, thank you guys all again for coming. I just like feel so overwhelmed and so happy to be here. And we are in a space that's called KGB Bar. Oh my God, Adina. Hi. <laughs> um, so in honor of that, I, I think I'm going to read a, a, an excerpt of an essay. Um, the title of it is Sami's Dot. Um, and just a little quick primer on what, what that is, in case some of you don't know, although I know there are some people in the room who definitely know what that is. Um, but Sami Stop basically describes a dissident activity that was common in the Eastern Bloc during, under communism, in which dissidents would um, recreate and uh, reprint materials, literature, music, stuff that was banned uh, by the government, and they would circulate it underground. So that's what Samistat means. Um, this essay is organized into five sections, and each section uh, is basically organized around a particular book. So I'm going to read two of these sections for you. The reading will take about 14 minutes. All right, so the first section uh, is organized around the novel, uh, The Land of Green Plums by the author Herta Mueller, and it was published in 1993. When I am reading about the green plums, I am in the Black Hills of South Dakota, the land of ponderosa pines. I have never seen a plum here, although they may exist. The only native fruits I know are small, desperate berries. I assume anything larger than a choke cherry is imported. Herta Mueller's universe is 5,000 miles and three decades away from my Dakota. Her characters are in Romania, living under Nicola Ceausescu's police state, a communist dictatorship. They are university students who become dissidents. Young people who read the dictator in every village tree because they are paranoid, but also because he is there, haunting all of the limbs. Mueller's language, even in translation, is hypnotic, paratactic. The narrator's father says green plums are dangerous, will make you lose your mind. Local authorities gorge themselves on the unripe fruit. The streets are so quiet you can hear chewing. The proletariat makes things no one needs. Tin, sheep, wooden, watermelon. Grass grows inside your brain. It gets cut when you decide to speak. An exclamation point after a greeting is normal, but a comma means your life is in danger. Having a cold means you are being followed. Nail clippers are an interrogation. Everything sounds silly. When I read about Mueller's student dissidents, it is summertime, so I take the book outside to an old army blanket spread beneath the ponderosa pines. It is 2011, the summer before I moved to Belarus to teach at the country's largest state university in Minsk. George W. Bush famously called Belarus Europe's last dictatorship, but some political scientists say that he is wrong. It is not exactly a dictatorship. It is true that in Belarus there are no free elections, no free press, no separation of powers. Alexander Lukashenko has been president for 25 years, but his is still not a totalitarian regime. Also, in Belarus, they decided not to change the name of the KGB to anything else, so they still just call it the KGB there. Um, just a fun fact. Um, <laughs> Alex Alexander Lukashenko's reign enjoys a certain degree of public consent, the analysts say. It is not as bad, not as wholly oppressive as it could be. Over 50% of Belarusians still work for the state, but at least now there is a McDonald's and a Nike store. Today's Belarus does not make you speak in code. It is not Ceausescu's Romania. But the summer before Belarus, dictator is the loudest word, the one I hear most clearly. I am enamored with the sound of it, the danger of it, the raised eyebrows when I tell people I am moving to a dictatorship. I am charmed by the weight of history and adventure and resilience in its three hard syllables. If it is possible to carry something like a word, then this is the one I take to Minsk. 
I arrive in August in time for the academic year. I begin teaching English, but every class feels like anthropology in disguise, like my students and I are studying each other through language. I am an eager researcher, but not always a good one. I project Mueller's characters onto my students, as if all young people at state schools and so-called dictatorships are the same. <laughs> After classes, I gorge myself on experience. A bombing in the metro, the worst inflation rates in the world, cookies with worms in them, women tricked into ballerina bodies and sex tourism, radiation fallout blowing north with the wind, full of state secrets, co-workers pointing at the ceiling when what they mean to say is our president. I am gluttonous. I eat these tiny poems and try to digest them. Independently, the images are silly, meaningless, but taken together, I am convinced they are hieroglyphs, signs directing me up to Lukashenko, to the dictator. I can barely contain myself because I think I have figured it out. I have cracked some code and that I must share my findings. I publish an essay on a US-based travel website. I don't make a conscious decision to mimic Mueller, but I am doing it. My language is paratactic, cryptic. When the essay goes live, I think that surely no Belarusians will ever find it, much less read it. They are not the audience for this US-based travel website, I reason. I am also young, and I take it for granted, for granted that writing is art and not politics, that writing can bring you to sighs or to tears, but that it will not bring you to jail. Some Belarusian dissidents, however, do not have the luxury of taking this for granted. They are dissidents who have been forced into exile. They operate a Belarusian oppositional news website from their living rooms in Lithuania, from the safety and security of the European Union. The, their website, called Charter 97, is illegal to access within the borders of Belarus. It suffers from near constant cyber attacks. The year before I moved to Minsk, the website's founder was found hanging from the rafters of his summer dacha. The authorities ruled it suicide. Though I am an amateur, a foreigner, and certainly not a dissident, the Belarusian opposition must agree with something I've written because they steal my words, translate them, and reprint them in their own underground corner of the internet. My essay appears in Charter 97 without my permission, 21st century Sami's dot. Less than 24 hours after the dissidents repost my essay, I will get a phone call from my boss at the university in Minsk. You will probably need to leave the country, she says. But what she means is that I am a snake in the grass. I am a traitor. I am a troublemaker. I have betrayed her. I have betrayed my students. She means that I have broken the first unspoken rule of places with dictators, which is that unless you want it to become as bad as Ceausescu's Romania, you cannot talk about it. Of course the dictator is everywhere, in every tree and limb, but you must not mention him. Pay no attention to the man hanging there. When I get off the phone, I am sick at how fixed and firm this rule feels, though still no one has ever said it to me. It is as straightforward as sunshine, at once too big and too obvious to be treated with words. In 1979, many years before she writes her novel, The Land of Green Plums, Herta Mueller is dismissed from her job at the factory because she refuses to cooperate with the Romanian secret police. A man wearing a windbreaker visits her at work, says to her, I know you better than you know tulips, which are arranged neatly in a vase on her desk. He wants her to spy on people close to her. He calls it collaborating, which sounds like artists creating. Mueller tells the windbreaker man, I don't have the character for this, and so he smashes her tulip vase against the wall. She says that when it shattered, it sounded like the air had teeth. In 2009, she is awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. In her acceptance speech, Mueller acknowledges that what can't be said can still be written. The dictator is always there, implied, while words spell out what the tongue cannot pronounce. When Mueller wins the Nobel Prize, Metropolitan Books releases a striking English edition of The Land of Green Plums. The cover is green with orange accents and a clip art statue of Lenin. His left arm is pointing straight ahead over the grassy hill, gesturing towards some future. In the writer's bio, it says that Mueller lost her job as a teacher for not cooperating with the state, but this is a small misprint. She wasn't a teacher. She was translating descriptions of hydraulic machines at a factory. Mueller says that the factory is where she first started writing, where she realized that language is hungry, that it begs to consume her experience. 
The factory is where she first learned that language is wolfish. Gluttony is a thing I too understand. All right, and the next section from this essay I'm going to read is organized around uh, Czesław Miloš's The Captive Mind, which was first published in 1953. My boss breathes, he breathes heavily into the phone. You will probably need to leave the country, she says, but what she means is that I am a traitor, I am a troublemaker. They suspend me from my job at the university, and I am told to wait for further instructions. I am afraid to leave my apartment. I have made a huge mistake publishing this stupid essay. I am from the land of brown grass and ponderosa pines, and I don't know the danger of unripe fruit because all I've ever had are choke cherries, which are small and desperate and not like real fruit at all. The dictator word was only ever abstract, imported through books and movies. I am taken by old troops, tropes, and I am naive. When my coworkers at the State University pointed to the ceiling and rolled their eyes, I figured this meant they were tired of the dictator. I figured this meant that they would agree with me. For maybe, a, for maybe a week after the call from my boss, I sleep on the couch and do not leave the apartment. I don't know why, but I am afraid of my bedroom. On the couch, I have dreams about pulling tap wires out from the green wallpaper. They run like streams up to the ceiling. I am haunted there, but certain that if I leave the living room, men in dark jackets will be waiting with nail clippers. They will catch me and hold me under bare light bulbs. I have mowed the grass too short this time, a real inconvenience. I will have to write to my mother and tell her about my cold, the pounding head cold, the one living inside me like a parasite. She will be so disappointed that I have gone and gotten myself sick. Hi, mom, comma, comma, comma. During this week on the couch, I am looking for anything to explain my predicament. My boss at the university used to tell me about how difficult the government made her life, how they were always interfering and implementing silly laws, how pitiable her salary was. Why then is she angry with me? I have only pointed toward the dictator. On the couch, I read about Ketman in Miłosz's The Captive Mind and think that maybe here I've found something like an answer. Ketman is a Persian concept used to describe the state of mind of a person who chooses to believe one thing while practicing or vocalizing another. It is, you could say, an intentional or protective form of cognitive dissonance. For Milos, writing in communist Poland, Ketman is a professional survival tool. It is paying, paying lip service to the oppressive regime while concealing one's true opposition. But Ketman involves much more than mere silence. It is an active facade, a complex psychological game of appearances. Ketman is acting, but instead of a theater stage, it is done on the street corner, at the chalkboard, in the bedroom. My presence in the university department upset the standard rules of the game. My coworkers wanted me, the American, to understand that they understood their own government to be an undemocratic nuisance. But just because they were comfortable disparaging the dictator around me does not mean I was in a position to disparage him myself. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> Milos says these contradictions pose a special problem for a country's intellectuals. I am camped in the living room, waiting for the hulking men who will interrogate me. I tell one local friend how frightened I am about being sent to Belarusian prison. Oh, when Victor went to prison, she says, after the election protest, we all sewed him socks and mittens. I sewed his name onto the mittens. It was really very sweet. She smiles and laughs a little as if we were dis discussing something average, a baby shower, perhaps. The hulking men never show up. I hear nothing for two weeks and am uninvolved in my own fate. Then I receive another phone call. I'm informed that perhaps if I write something more positive, we might be able to negotiate. It is a cryptic suggestion. I don't understand how writing a follow-up essay would help unless I were to say that I didn't mean any of this, but then I explain that I cannot really lie, but I do wanna still teach my classes. So I agree to write something more positive. I open a blank Word document. I am trembling like an old tram, but as I move through sentences, I start to feel grateful. I am glad to be writing about Belarusian food and hospitality and my dear friends here, the people who seemed shocked at my earlier indiscretion. 
Why didn't you write about my mother's cookies? A friend had asked after reading the essay on Charter 97. I did not have a good answer. Her mother makes amazing sugar cookies, but I had written instead about some cookies purchased at Minsk's fancy central grocery store that were crawling with worms. I guess I am drawn to rot. And if I'm honest, I had not intended for Belarusians to read that essay. It was not a true dialogue. I contact the editor of the US-based travel website. He is confused about why I would need to publish a positive follow-up, which is exactly what Milos said would happen for those in the West do not need Ketman. The editor is American. I am also American, I explained to him. And I have only just now begun to understand how frightening it is to find a pair of nail clippers on the kitchen counter, not at all where you left them. I have only just now begun to feel the mucus build up in my throat, signs of an awful, inevitable head cold. I have only just now taken up acting. In fact, I do not say any of this to the American editor, but I think you understand. Okay, I'm gonna stop there for now. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you could do me a huge favor and buy another drink and tip the bartender, that would be awesome. And buy the book. You, there's buy also the a book. few books for sale if you want those. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you all so, so much. I'm so grateful. Okay, I'll drink something. Bye. <laughs>